You can't always believe what other people say when it comes to fish keep. In this video, I am going to debunk 10 common myths around betta fish. What is going on guys? Harry here from Farm Aquatics. Always take advice with a grain of salt. Don't believe everything you read or hear out there when it comes to betta fish. And honestly, I'm no exception to this rule. Always do your research with multiple trusted sources and formulate your own opinion. Today, I'm going to address 10 common myths you hear about betta fish and explain why they simply are untrue. The first myth is that bubble nests are a sign of happiness. The truth of the matter is betta fish will build bubble nests regardless of whether they are in pristine living conditions or horrid living conditions. Building bubble nests is an instinctually driven behavior. They don't simply do it if they're quote unquote happy. Sometimes you'll see betta fish owners gauge their betta's happiness based off of the fact that they're building bubble nests. Or worse, they'll justify a poorly set up tank for their beta with the fact that bubble nests are present. There is no correlation. From an anecdotal perspective, I've seen plenty of betas build bubble nests in these teeny tiny cups that you see at retail pet stores. And we can all agree, those cups aren't exactly the best living conditions. So next time you see your beta build a bubble nest, don't automatically assume they're in the best living conditions. There's always room for improvement. The second myth is that air stones are necessary for a betta fish's tank or setup. Air stones simply aerate your tank's water with oxygen by increasing the rate of turnover between the surface of the water and the air column above. They provide no form of filtration for your tank, which is another common misconception, by the way. The question is, are air stones absolutely necessary for betta fish tanks? The answer is more often than not, no. Assuming you're keeping your beta in a 20 to 30 gallon tank or less, if you have a filter running, that should be more than enough oxygenation for your tank. On the flip side, if you don't have any form of filtration running, thinking about an air stone should probably be the last thing on your list. You have bigger fish to fry. On top of all of that, betas have what you call a labyrinth organ, which basically allows them to go up to the surface of the water and take a gulp and be able to actually utilize that oxygen in the air column. The next question is, are air stones harmful for your beta fish? While we established that they're pretty much useless in the setting of a beta tank, do we take it a step further and say that they actually have a negative impact on betas? I would say theoretically. We all know that betas prefer as minimal a flow and or current in their tank as possible. Air stones are known for their characteristic bubbles, which you guessed it, creates flow to an extent. Admittedly, this flow is nothing comparable to the flow of say a hang on back filter going at full speed. But since we established that there are virtually no benefits air stones create nothing but unnecessary disturbance, which can theoretically add unneeded stress to your betta fish. Next myth is the assumption that every single big box fish store employee knows what they're talking about. A lot of misconceptions and myths spread from these big box pet stores that just happen to sell fish. The truth is an employee can be taught to do the maintenance required to keep the tanks running in that store, but it really is on them at the end of the day to be passionate enough to learn about the ins and outs of fish keeping, which by the way, even differs significantly by the type and species of fish. Disclaimer, I'm fully aware that there are some big box pet store workers that live, breathe, and sleep fish. But the point I'm trying to make here is that working at one of those stores should not automatically imply credibility. The issue is that big box pet store employees are often the very first source of information for people just starting in the hobby. But you really need to take everything that they say with a grain of salt. The key is to always diversify your sources of information, as I said earlier. Over time, you'll find trustable sources and knowledgeable people in the hobby and hopefully by watching this video you'll already be a few steps ahead. My other suggestion is to go to your local mom and pop fish store if you have one nearby. If it's a small business or family owned fish store you have a much higher chance of success with engaging with an employee that actually knows his or her stuff. Side note if you come across an employee that obviously doesn't know what they're talking about please don't be rude to them. A thing I often see in this specific hobby are people with huge egos that constantly feel the need to talk down on others who may not be as knowledgeable as them or may just have a different opinion on a topic based off of their experience. If you're one of those people, first, press Alt F4 and second, you're just doing as much damage to the hobby as those giving false advice. Don't be a All right, all right. 
rant over, calm down, Harry. The fourth myth that I usually see is that betas can live just off of plant roots. This myth comes from the fact that people would literally put betas in flower vases, especially back in the day. I've even heard horror stories of betas being used as centerpieces at weddings. Admittedly, I often see my betas peck at the roots of my aquatic plants in my tanks, but this is not an adequate nor sustainable source of food for them. Beta fish are insectivores at the end of the day, thus a majority of their diet should consist of high quality protein. Plant matter simply cannot be adequately digested by betas, thus debunking the myth that they can live off of the roots of plants. Always make sure you're buying fish food specifically tailored to betas. Look at the ingredients, make sure the main source is not only protein, but a high quality form of protein like fly larvae or shrimp. I prefer to avoid foods that have fish meal as the first ingredient. Then look at the percentage of protein in the nutritional facts. This should be at least 45% in my opinion. My favorite fish foods are one, fluval bug bites, and then two, Northman beta bits. Fifth myth is that filters are not necessary because they live in quote unquote dirty water. This myth derives from the fact that people often think betas come from small, dirty, shallow puddles of water in Asia. When you see videos of these native habitats, yes, the water is usually brown or green, but there's a difference between dirty water and the water you see wild betas living in. The great thing about the wild is that these natural habitats are usually filled with aquatic plants and thus natural sources of filtration. This water is not quote unquote dirty in the sense of poor water parameters, but may just be visibly brown or green due to dead plant matter collecting in these areas. Remember when we said betas don't like bodies of water with high currents? Well, this is seen in nature and is a factor to that buildup. See how it's all connected? The dead plant matter is called malm and has minimal impact to water parameters. Tannins from leaves that may fall into the water or wood can also contribute to the brownish hue. Key takeaway, use a filter. Next myth, and this is more of a misconception, is that since purchasing a beta is relatively inexpensive, new fish keepers assume that the cost of keeping a fish is also affordable. It's not uncommon to see betas go for as low as $5 at pet stores. And while the startup cost for a beta fish is incomparable to say the startup cost of a puppy or even a reptile, you can very easily get into a money pit in the fish keeping hobby. And I'm speaking from experience here. There's a concept in the hobby coined multi-tank syndrome and and believe me, it's real. In addition to that, when you add the recurring costs of food, water conditioner, electricity, your water bill, and even fertilizer if you're about that life, just to name a few, all of those costs add up and add up fast without you even realizing it. I actually did a video that broke down the true cost of owning a beta, and I'll link it down below. In that video, I break down two scenarios. One, the frugal approach, and two, the balls to the wall, throw all the money you have at the cashier approach. I recommend you check out that video after this one. The final cost may surprise you. Seventh myth is that betas will stop eating when and they're full. The truth is betas are notoriously known to eat themselves to death. If there's food in front of them and that beta is not picky, they will keep munching away until the food is gone. So no, don't assume beta fish know exactly when they're full and choose on their own volition to stop eating. For this reason, it's very important to be intentional and strict with your beta fish's food regimen. The biggest risk of believing in this myth is that you're more likely to overfeed your beta fish. Overfeeding can result in bloat, bloat can lead to constipation, constipation can result in swim bladder disease, and if not addressed, there is a point of no return. I'll link down the video I have on how to determine how much and how often you should feed your beta fish. Myth number eight is that betas prefer to be in small confined vases or bowls. This myth stems from a number of factors in the industry. When you walk into a big box fish store, what is the first thing you see in the fish section? Betas in these characteristically small cups. When an unsuspecting novice fish keeper dilly dallies into these stores and sees these cups, they can easily assume this is the normal standard at which betas can thrive in, which we all know simply isn't the case. Another contributing factor is those ridiculous beta specific tanks that litter these pet stores and usually range from one to two 
two gallons, sometimes even smaller. Again, an unassuming beginner fish keeper can look at these and automatically think, if it's made specifically for betas, it's gotta be good enough. Don't fall for the marketing tactics. On this channel, I don't really recommend anything less than five gallons at an absolute minimum. You can theoretically get away with 2.5 gallons, but chances of success are much slimmer if you are a beginner. If you really want to increase your odds of success, I'd even venture to recommend a 10 gallon tank or larger. The larger the tank, the higher margin for error and the better chances of success for you. All right, ninth myth is that you can use distilled water in betta fish tanks. The misconception here is that since there is no chlorine in distilled water, it must be safe for betta fish. But distilled water lacks more than just chlorine. It has no minerals or nutrients. It's just pure water. Betas need certain essential minerals in their water to thrive physiologically, many of which you can get from dechlorinated tap water. Use of distilled water isn't really recommended. You may get away with it short term, but long term use of distilled water can lead to deficiencies with your betta fish. Just use dechlorinated tap water, it really is not that difficult. All right, the last and final myth is the belief that as long as two betas are females, they can easily and happily live in the same tank. Ah, the good old concept of beta sororities. When you hear a blanket statement from someone saying that betas can live together as long as they're females, either one, they're trying to make a point that male betas can't live together, or two, they've never kept a beta sorority in the past. There are a whole slew of factors that need to be considered in order for a beta fish sorority to be even potentially successful long term. From tank size, how it's decorated, to the number of betas, to even how the betas were born. This is a lengthy topic and honestly deserves its own video, but to my original point, if you were to take one random female beta, plop it in a five or 10 gallon tank with another random female beta, I'd be willing to bet it wouldn't be too long before you'd have to separate them. In conclusion, just because betas are females does not automatically indicate they can coexist in a tank. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Hopefully this was helpful and you learned something new. Don't fall for these myths and there are plenty of more myths out there. If you want me to do a second video on additional myths to debunk, let me know down in the comments. It's always a pleasure to provide value to you guys. If I did provide any value, be sure to hit that like button. It really does help out the channel. And if you wanna know when I post next, be sure to subscribe, hit that notification bell, and I will see you guys in the next one. Peace.